Right. <laughs> no okay, so we'll have a, um, a genuine native app can have extra privileges uh, and can access parts of the, the phone hardware that a website just can't. Now, one of the problems with building native apps, and partly, is that there's two competing types of mobile app. You've got Apple devices and you've got your Google Android devices. And they generally, like the languages that they used to develop are incompatible with each other. Um, the design systems for actually building front end visually is very different. Um, there's a high learning curve for each of them. Um, so if you wanted to develop for both platforms, you'd have two high learning curves to deal with. Um, and it often feels like there's very little transferable knowledge from web development. So it's like you, you are basically going back to scratch. Uh, and that's why things like React Native starts to, to take off. Um, so React Native is a cross-platform development environment that you build, the theory is you write once and it, it builds a native iPhone app and a native Android app from the same code. It's using familiar idioms from React and JSX. Um, so the learning curve is shallower. It's not negligible, but it's definitely a lot easier than um, na native development used to be. Um, and it's open source as well, which um, is reassuring for quite a lot of people. But I've found like, that in React Native, the tooling has not always been great. Um, and so you're often fighting with the development environment. Um, and if you're using the standard libraries that it comes with, it's like sometimes you'll find that you're limited to using only the features that are common in both devices. So it can mean that as a user, it doesn't really feel like it's a part of your phone. But there have been a lot of recent advancements. Um, both platforms now use a lot more, more modern languages. Um, nearly everything at Apple is written now in Swift as opposed to Objective-C, which predates even C++, which was the, um, it used to be Apple's main development language. Um, Android, now there are lots of different um, languages that compile down to the Java virtual machine, so you don't have to work on Java itself. The design systems have got a lot easier. They're still different from each other, but they're a lot easier to use. Um, and they use a lot of modern programming concepts, which means that the learning curve is shallower and there is a lot more commonality um, with other development environments, including JavaScript. And that means there's much less work to achieve the same goals. And that means that I, I personally think that actually being able to develop for a single platform, and in, in this case, I'm talking about iOS, but it, the same applies to uh, Android as well, is a lot more viable than it used to be. And it's fun, which is the most important part. So SwiftUI itself was first introduced two years ago with iOS 13. Uh, and it's been improved each year since then. Um, and Apple describes it as helping you to build great looking apps across all their platforms using the power of Swift, the Swift language and as little code as possible. I mean, they would say that. Um, <laughs> but it is true that you can actually use the same components on phones, iPads, and Mac. Uh, but also tvOS, watchOS, all of them use SwiftUI now. And this is the problem that Apple had, was that you did have four very different development environments <clears throat> with four very different user interface languages. Um, AppKit um, descends from um, the old next step days that precipitated OS X that was around for years. Then when the first iPhones came along, they developed iPhone OS, as it was called then, uh, but they were very low power, um, low storage devices. So UIKit was um, built to optimize for that particular advantage. So um, AppKit and UIKit started to diverge away from each other. 
tvOS development had something that they called UI kit but was actually slightly different. And if you uh, made the mistake of thinking that because iPhone and tvOS both used UI kit, you'd be able to transfer one to the other, that didn't, didn't work like that. Um, WatchKit has its own thing that nobody ever uses because nobody wants to build watch applications anymore. <laughs> but now Swift UI sits on top of all of them. So it doesn't, it's not a replacement for UIKit or AppKit. What it is doing is allowing you to describe the interface you want, and then it goes away and actually creates the UIKit elements that create the interface itself. So this is an example of Swift UI code that Apple has on their website. Um, where you have a view, a uh, little bit of a model, and then the body of the view, you can see it's like we're getting a list of items. Um, we're looping through, and each one of them is going to have enclosed an, an image uh, and a stack of two items of text that's aligned vertically, which is what a V stack does. Um, they're aligned at the leading edge, which is the left hand side for English language. Um, and the second one is going to be colored gray. And that is basically how Swift UI views work. I'm going to give you a Swift example. Now, I was intending to type this live, and then I thought that's a really stupid idea. So um, I'm just going to show you. Uh, so this is the, what I'm going to build. It's just a list of all Shakespeare's plays, um, the year we think they were first produced, and the number of words in them. So we'll start off with a very basic view. This is what um, Xcode gives you when you first start up a new view. It's just saying, hello world. Uh, you can see on line four, I've already imported a data model. Let's get this rolling. Okay, so get rid of that. We can put um, the navigation view, which gives the structure to the page, we'll put in a list. And we give the list the title of plays. And we're going to loop through the plays from the data model. <coughs> and each loop, is going to, the object is going to be called play, that's a local variable name. And we're going to create a vertical stack lining, aligning on the left edge. And the, the first item we'll be able to see is the title. And you can see that the preview is running live with live data. And then underneath it, we have a horizontal stack. Um, first with the play year, and with numbers, you have to say whether they're numbers, currency, or um, percentages, or you can use text interpolation, which is something we're pretty much used to in JavaScript and Ruby. Um, and then once you've got the basic data there, you can tweak it a little bit. Let's give the title a uh, more prominent font. Uh, Swift UI uses semantic names for its standard font sizing. We can apply the subheadline font to the whole stack, and that, that affects every text item within it. Uh, we can get rid of the comma in the names, because we don't really want to have commas in, <laughs> in the year, sorry. Um, and then we change the color of the word count. Uh, and that is a working thing. I tried doing that in UI kits to remind myself what it was like, and it took me 40 minutes. <laughs> because you have to worry, you have to manage all the alignments of each control to eat, um, yourself. So that's basically that, right, we can all go home. Have you, have you done a, well, to show it on the other, uh, I think that's the platform like TVOS and the Mac application. And I'm just going to stick to iOS data. There's a lot to deal with, so I'm going to like focus just on that. Yeah, but but yeah, so like um, lists on each platform do render slightly differently, but the syntax is almost identical. Um, you supplied additional grants to, to tune it for different platforms. Uh, yes, I'll get to some of the ways we can tune what um, each item looks like on the page in a bit. So say so, so views themselves are very lightweight. <coughs> data objects called structs in Swift. And that's what the, the Swift UI subsystem uses those descriptions to build the actual interface. Oh, sorry. Um, lots of views have child views. Here we had children that, that were text views and we passed the data into those child views in their initializer. 
And then we use modifiers like the text size and foreground color to change the presentation and visual style of those components. <laughs> And the modifier order matters. You can chain them. Um, but here, if you were to apply a modifier that applied padding and then something that applied background, that background would get applied to the original view and the padding area. But if you apply the background first, it would only apply the background to the view, and then the padding would go round the background. And yeah, stacks provide uh, an easy way of um, laying out controls, we'll go into layout a little bit more a bit later on. And one thing I didn't do in that example was have any sort of dynamic state, that was all static content. Um, but this is what we do all the time in React is like we um, have interfaces that generally react to changes in state. Uh, and there's a few different ways of managing state. So I will get into the first demo. Now, because this screen's so large, I'm going to have to difficulty to which one is which. So, obviously, I can't, I've lost my cursor. Oh, there we go. Uh, so, this is the view, and you can see we've got various values here marked with at state at the beginning. So, we've got a currency value, a season, which is uh, sort of like an enumerated value can only be one of four possible values, uh, email address, password, and a collection of dates that will be our login attempt. And yeah, <clears throat> in this first value here, I'm going to point on the screen, which is not going to take people here, uh, uh, but the, we have a stepper here, which is uh, plus and minus. And the, on the right hand side. And if you increment it, it's going to add uh, a random amount between one and 100. And if you press the minus sign, it's going to um, subtract a random amount. But what you see um, that's different from React is that you're actually using the, the standard variable name. There's no sort of like equivalent of a setter function. And so that, as soon as you if I change that to a live preview mode. So we're changing the currency value and then the text above automatically adjusts as well, which <coughs> uh, the next section down. So I really can't see that now. Uh, so we've got a list of four items and uh, we've got a picker that can actually choose which four we want to display. So we'll select both of those. And above it, uh, we're calling something called season display view with the season element in. I'll show you that display view a little bit later on just for something else. Uh, and below that, now, this is, yeah. So I just updated to the latest beta of Xcode and entering text in live previews is broken. <laughs> so let's see if I can build a full app which should allow me to enter text. If we scroll down on the view, you'll see as with season, when you're actually referencing state that needs to change in sub views, you actually use a binding form of the variable that starts with a dollar sign. And that's that's what allows a subview to uh, alter its parents' state. Is this working? No. It's running somewhere. I've got two screens and it's on either of them. <laughs> okay. So I won't say that, but that um, you can also, if you look at the line 86, where the button is actually disabled because um, one or both of these fields are empty. Obviously, as soon as you change the state of either of those, that gets re-evaluated automatically. <laughs> um, and if I could get the text entry working, you could see that we can actually loop through failed attempts every time I enter the 
love this, but I won't be able to do that. <laughs> so this season view, I just want to say quickly that we pass in the season and the, the sub view has no knowledge that is actually a state variable at all. As far as it's concerned, it's a read only value. Um, when the season changes in the parent view, we build a completely new instance of this view and the description changes, which is really lightweight, but might keep everything nice and isolated. Um, it's got its own little state variable there, which I'm going to use in a bit of animation. Um, so every time we tap the title, that value just changes from a Boolean and SwiftUI is able to animate the effect from when that Boolean is true to when that Boolean is false and back. Um, and you can see here, here I'm using it uh, like line 127, um, an easy and out um, animation with a duration of three seconds, just so I can show you it and again. So that's basically state. It's not a, um, and that's sort of like anybody who's used React would be familiar with that, even though the syntax is different. Um, I think we've gone through all these points. So I'm not going to repeat them again. But if you have lots of related um, state values, that can be a bit of a code smell. The same way that if you've got lots of use state values in a React component, it's usually a sign that there's actually a bigger data model that you actually want to be modeling. Um, and for, for that, we have state objects, which is almost similar. If I now go to the So here we have uh, an object called sign up form with lots of different um, variables in it. And they're all marked with, with published this time. And the class itself is marked as observable object. And those are <coughs> Swift UI's techniques for allowing the Swift UI subsystem to pick up any changes. Um, and yeah, if I knew where this version of the simulator had gone, I would be able to show you but instead of accessing individual elements from state, you actually access the form. So you can see on the, the email address line, we've got the text and the dollar, dollar form, the binding form references form dot email address, but everything works <coughs> exactly the same way. Where is this? Ah. Aha, here we go. Well, let's make this a little bit bigger. So again, so like, got some state that can automatically update. Um, you've got other state that makes other elements show and hide. Um, we use the same control, a picker for the season here, but because we're in a list, Swift UI automatically presents it in a different format that is that iPhone users would be more accustomed to. And then you select one and it changes again. Um, and you have default date pickers as well, which are all nice and handily designed. And this is a form element, which is basically just a very special layout element that SwiftUI provides. It doesn't provide any sort of form validations or anything. It's basically just like, just allows you to list elements and they automatically get nicely laid out. Now the thing about classes, which a state object is, is that they are reference objects. And if you pass them into a child view, they get an exact, they get the exact same instance that the parent had. So you, you change the value in one and it changes in the other, which is why like, classes are really good for um, passing data models between views. 
but in the same way that you know, we actually don't necessarily want to have have to pass the data model all the way down. Um, we have something called environment objects. Now, if you've used React and you've, context is the same, you're able to declare a data model right at the very top of your view and then opt in at any point further down the view hierarchy. And this one, uh, oh, this is So this is an app that um, if you follow Apple Swift UI tutorials, you end up building yourself. Um, but it has a data <coughs> model um, with a lot of US natural landmarks. I really should have planned for you know, the season and stuff. So the very, very top, outside even the view hierarchy, there's um, the app object which represents the launch point of your app. So you can actually create your data model here. And then you pass it in using this modifier environment object. And then if we go to the root view, which is the content view, uh, and which is, so this is basically managing, uh, giving a tab view of two pages. So it's not actually using the environment object itself. But I, in this preview, which, uh, if you, the preview provider, such as Line 34, is what actually drives the, the live preview on the screen. You do actually have to provide an environment object. If you don't do that, it, the whole thing crashes. But here, content view doesn't make any reference to it at all, but it is actually embedding category home, which is this page, and landmark list, which is the page to the right. And they are both accessing that original data model that is higher up. Oops. Yeah, so it sort of like, gives, allows us to have a single source of truth um, that we opt into. And then we declare, instead of using state object, use environment object, and SwiftUI does the rest. As long as you remember to do it. If you Just a crash. Is it the crash will happen in development? It's an environment object. Do you actually have something called environment, which is for single values? But, but we don't tend to use them. Best used for are uh, whether your phone has been switched to dark mode. You can find out what the various accessibility settings on the phone are if someone's opted into using um, increased contrast or reduced motion or wants to change the font size in some way. Um, but a lot of the, the component views that you use to build up your own views are already using these environments. Uh, so if you change, decide that you no longer want to use the, the Gregorian calendar and you want to change to the Buddhist calendar, you change that and your calendar views will automatically update. Um, things like that. Environment values are also used for stuff that should be applied um, to all child views equally. Now, we don't have CSS, so we don't have inheritance in that way. So Swift UI uses environment values to provide that those sort of inheritance. That's how you can apply a text style to a stack and it applies to everything inside that stack. And it's also used for some single use callbacks. So if you were to display a modal view, um, you can access an environment variable called dismiss, and that provides you with the, the, fun, the callback function that we used to dismiss that modal view and return you to where you were. And one last bit of um, the state data is persistence. Now for large data models, SwiftUI doesn't handle that, it expects you to do that for yourself, whether that's like persisting to a, a backend or serializing to JSON and storing it in the app's uh, storage space. But for small user defaults, we have two 
um, systems. One's called scene storage and one called app storage. They both basically both work the same way and they allow various values to be saved so that if you if the app quits or you switch your phone off and then switch it back on again, you can basically resume from where you were and it remembers your choices. The difference between the two is like negligible on iPhones because um, an iPhone app can only have one window instance at a time. But on iPads and on Mac OS, you can, the same app can have multiple windows. Um, so scene storage is what you would use for um, anything which might differ between those two windows. And app storage is something that works across all windows all the time. So say it's like you have an option of whether you're going to be auto saving as you go. That's an app wide setting. So you use app storage for that. Um, but if you have a tab view, you wouldn't want to have two windows and change the tab in one view and have the other window change with you because you might want to see two different types of data. So you would use scene storage for that. And as soon as that window disappears, you lose that storage. But mm -hmm. as long as that window is open and if you resume, um, it will remember everything. So that's state, oh, sorry. And layout is very, very different from CSS. Uh, there, there is no um, Flexbox. <coughs> um, React Native, which uses that for, for its layout. Uh, instead, um, it's basically a series of negotiations. So the parent view will ask, knows how much space it's got available. It asks its child views how much space it needs. Uh, and the child view will either, will either say, oh, I'm gonna shrink that frame to fit my content, or it'll, it will expand its content to fit the frame. And those decisions go down all the branches of the tree and come back up and by the time everything's worked out, everybody, everything knows where it should be. And it's a lot simpler than I've made it sound. <laughs> um, and so really the only thing that um, so we can use stacks to alter the uh, placement of, of things side by side, but in terms of white space and spacing, stacks and also grids, which we have available, which do work like CSS grids, um, you can space between elements um, and then you can apply padding around all one or a very variation of uh, edges. And that is basically what we do. Um, the other thing we have is a special view called a spacer, which doesn't do any rendering. It's just, if it's in a stack, it will expand to fit as much possible space <clears throat> as you want. So if you have a horizontal stack with two items and put a spacer in between, the one on the right will move all the way out to the right edge. Uh, and that's basically all it does. If any of that, for, for any reason, doesn't quite work, um, there is a frame modifier where you can override what it's doing. So you can like, explicitly set widths or heights, particularly for images, it's really useful for that. Um, or you could even say, sort of like, I, this is a maximum width, this, this can only be 400 pixels wide, it can't go any wider, um, and things like that. Um, but the more you can avoid using frame settings, the better and the quicker your you views actually go. In terms of Z ordering views on top of one another, we do have a thing called a Z stack. Um, and then you, you choose how all those items get aligned, whether they're all aligned on the center or on the top left or whatever. Um, and that frame calculation, all frames in the Z stack contribute to that decision. So if one item in your stack decides it's going to be three times the width of your phone, that is the width that all the frames in the stack will get. And something that can actually be a lot easier to deal with is that a single view can just have a background layer and an overlay layer. So you get a, like a stack of up to three items, but the central one is the key one and it's the only one that makes the sizing decision. Um, Backgrounds and overlays are also views, but they basically take the, the frame that the, the main view has set. You can alter Z-index manually. I have only ever seen it used in animations where uh, as things are moving around the screen, it becomes imperative to know which one's going to be on top. 
um, because a lot of the animation decisions are taken away from you. Sometimes that's counterintuitive films I didn't actually help you sort that out. And in terms of animation, so the best way of ordering animation is actually putting the state changes and animate it. There's a number of timing curves. So we like, again, familiar with CSS animations, like stuff, whether it starts quickly and slows down, or it starts slowly and speeds up. Um, you also have spring ones where it's like it does a little bounce before it rests into the final position. And if you're actually removing or inserting views, there are transitions as well, which I'm not going to show you. But the key, the best thing, this the really cool thing, is if you have two separate views, Views that have component views in there, you can actually make it look as if the child views are automatically moving from one location to the other. If you ever use magic move in Keynote, we just have two slides, put the same object in two different positions on each slide, and it works out the transition between the two. It's a bit like that. Now we am going to show you that. Oops. It's really cool. <coughs> And it's a music app, it doesn't do anything. Um, and we've got a little mini player, um, like Apple Music would have down at the bottom. If you click on a track and it will pretend it starts playing, there's no sound on here, which is great. Um, but if you click on it, you, you actually see in the code. We've got a, a Boolean value saying show full player, which is currently false. So as a result, we're showing the mini player. And if we change that to true by clicking on it, it then animates, but all those child components track and move into position nice and easily. So it's sort of like really smooth and slick animation. So if you've ever been on the iPhone app store and you've seen those big images and you tap one and it moves to the top of the screen as the header image of the next page, that's how it's done. Um, it's really nice and it's like <coughs> next to no code. Um, within the actual view, you assign um, unique IDs to the relative items and then it works out everything for you. Uh, but somehow I've sort of set back quite a few pages. Okay, so in terms of design consistency, obviously it's like if we're just shoving modifiers and views in into the lots of different files, it can be quite hard to make sure they all look consistent. You have a coherent design to your app. And there's a few things that um, Xcode and um, the, Apple, the Swift UI design system help you with. The first is a thing called the asset catalog. It's something that's been around in Xcode for quite a while, but it basically allows us to store um, colors, static images uh, by name. Um, but you can also um, have variations of each of those. So uh, if, for example, if when switching to dark mode, you needed a particular color to be slightly tweaked, um, you could put that alternative color in the asset catalog as the dark mode alternative, and everything else is worked out for you. The user switches to dark mode and the color changes. Uh, and so you can put colors, so you can also put in like, vector images in there as well if you're gonna use them. And in, in our Swift UI views, you reference them using the string name that you've used in the asset catalog, which is great, it's nice and readable. Um, the only trouble is that if you use a string identifier that doesn't exist in the asset catalog at runtime, it crashes. So, and if you're gonna be using these colors all over the place, that can be really tricky to do with. And the compiler um, can't check the contents of your string for you. 
So um, it won't be able to verify at, at compile time that you've used the right colors. So one technique we use is using Swift's ability to add extensions to any objects in the Swift library. So we have the standard color object, we can extend it and create a static variable that references the color from that asset catalog. In this case, we give it a name of brand orange. And when we use it, we use it, um, the compiler can then see that that is a variable that's available. Um, so you get auto com auto complete auto suggestion and it's compiled and the only place you're using the text string is in one place. So the chances of making a typo are greatly reduced. If you do make a typo on the, on the variable name that get picked up and your app just won't compile. And the other advantage with Swift is if it knows that a particular um, property or argument in a function has to be of a particular type, you can actually remove the actual object definition. So dot brand orange, it goes, well, there's a color dot brand orange, that must be what you mean, um, unless you go straight off. Um, and that's how, um, when we're looking at those text styles and using headline and subheadline, um, if you proceed those by a dot, it's because those are static variables that are giving you those particular values. And in terms of iconography, um, Apple now has this system called F symbols that it's using across all its apps and has made publicly available to everybody to use. And it's a collection of over 3,200 vector icons. And they're specifically designed to complement text. So you can sit them alongside text and they look right. You know, it's like they're all baseline aware. When you put them into your Swift UI view using image system name, they scale along with your font. So if you if you are if you specify a title size, your icon will change size um, as well. But as well as that, they're also font weight aware. <clears throat> so if you have an icon next to bold text, you can make the icon um, stroke width match the weight of the font. And it just makes everything look a lot more cohesive. Some of them are even localization aware. There's a couple of uh, symbols that have letters or numbers in. And if your current locale is uh, using a different alphabet system, it will use the, the, the appropriate um, icon for that locale. It's really cool. And when they were first introduced, that's back in um, iOS 13, you could only have them as monochrome. But now you can actually have a variety of colors. You have, um, some have predefined colors that the designers have, have set. So if you want a multicolor version of the, of the icon, you use the colors that they give you. Um, some have like half tone and start with tinted opacity and some elements in the icon. Um, and, or you can choose to actually just like color them however you want. There's up to three palette colors you can use and then um, the world's your oyster. And I'll just show you, you have the, there's the, this SF Symbols app, which is a free download from Apple. Um, and it shows you all the icons that are available. And if we, so you can either have them in monochrome and choose which color you want. So if you go for a nice cayenne teal, <coughs> hierarchical is where some elements will be tinted which can be a lot nicer particularly for the ones that have like large degrees of <coughs> sometimes it's, like it's more appropriate but it's like everything is still in the same brand color the multicolor ones um, are where there's particular semantic meaning to particular colors and apple have said you should use this color for this part of the, the icon some of them still have um, a mixture of forced color and select and changeable color. Or you can switch to the palette mode and have real fun, 
making the ugliest color combinations you can manage. <laughs> And the good thing about it, all, with the, the palette mode, these could even be gradients as well. So it starts getting really weird. That's right, I've seen some of them. Uh, I'll just show you that. What does SF stand for? San Francisco is Apple's native font. That's all the well, system fonts uh, all available in. And there is a special view that uses those called label where you can specify a text and one of those images and it basically will render them uh, treats them as a single image for a single item for accessibility so it won't try and describe the icon it just goes uh, this is delete um, but you can also get the display can vary on context. Some various contexts with that Apple provides automatically choose things. So this is actually screen grab of a, a swipe action. So if you're swiping to delete and see just this label, it would only show the icon because there's only space for that. If you had swipe to delete on something larger, it might show the icon and the text. And on menus, it might go back to the icon again. And all, a lot of Apple's designs actually have variants, which are basically saying like how to style like some of these complex controls up. Um, if you choose automatic as the style, that's basically the same as not applying a style at all. Um, but yeah, so that label is icon and text. You can apply a style that says, in this instance, I only want the icon. In this instance, I only want the text. Text field by default, it gives you a plane which has no border and rounded border, and that's it. Uh, and on Mac OS, you have square border as an option. Toggles can either be a switch or a, a button, so it's like, or a checkbox on Mac OS, but not on iOS. And picker, where you're choosing a, a, from a list of items, um, could either be a menu, could be a segmented control, which shows you all of them in a strip. Uh, could be a wheel where you like, spin to find the right one. Um, buttons can have borders and they might not, they might be more prominent. But all of these styles, you can create your own. So if you wanted a particular way in which your buttons were laid out, you could create a custom button style and apply that where it was needed. So for a label, um, each of the, these styles work the same way. They're given a configuration object that has access to the component parts, and then you cho choose how you lay them out in the view. So here, um, we're creating one that um, is to a vertical stack, so that one above the other, aligning on the center, uh, and we're displaying the icon first, scaling it up a bit so it looks a bit larger, and putting the text below, and that would be how it looks uh, using that style. If you wanted to add custom uh, icons, you can do. Um, up until very recently, the way you had to do it, you would export uh, an item from SF, the SF Symbols app that was closest to the app that you had, and you would then tweak it. And in iOS 13 and 14, you had to tweak it 27 times to get that um, whole functionality of being able to respond to size and font weight and line strokes. And quite understandably, nobody did this. Can't think why. So in iOS 15, they've um, changed it a bit, and now you only have to do three. And all the others will be interpolated from those three. Um, and there's various rules about how you name the, the various elements in the SVG. And you then import it back into the SF Symbols app, which audits it, and, you can, uh, and then is able to produce a little file which goes into your app and allows you to actually use your custom symbol in the same way that all the standard symbols are used. Um, nearly there. Uh, just a little word on concurrency. And obviously, like on in JavaScript, we do a little bit with async await, but it's generally it's, it's a single threaded process. Um, with phones these days, we have the potential to be doing multiple things at once. And up until 
this year, Swift as a language didn't have any built-in concurrency code of its own. We had to rely on stuff that was originally written for Objective-C um, years and years ago, and it was a bit of a nightmare. Um, but now, with Swift 5.5, which is what um, the latest phones come with, um, you can use async await in exactly the same way as you use in JavaScript and several other languages. Um, there's lots of other bits and pieces around that that Swift provides as well. So you can have lots of, you can have parallel async processes that re return once all of them are finished. Um, but the async await uh, system is like really nice and clean and understandable and transferable. But obviously Swift SwiftUI has been around for a while. It's like couldn't use that before. So Apple created their own publish and subscribe system called Combine. So, and this is how SwiftUI works. It subscribes to um, all the state variables. And when those state variables change, they publish a notice to say, I've changed. And that is what triggers the re-evaluation of the view. And there is a lot of stuff you can do with Combine. It's really, really powerful. Um, and it's a lot better than what was there, but it's also like really, really tricky to understand. But you do things like um, with a text box, being able to de debounce and do all sorts of things. It's like you can tie into the, the, the publisher that that text box emits and do all sorts of crazy things. But um, iOS 15 has now started like building components and modifiers that use async await <coughs> behind the scenes to actually make them a lot easier to, to create for them in the first place and for us to use. Um, things like um, search bars, uh, pull to refresh becomes a one-liner. Um, images that are being downloaded from the internet and they have a special view called async image, which handles everything. So you, you can either just say, I'll display this image once it's downloaded. Um, you can specify a placeholder that should be shown until it's downloaded. Or you can actually examine the whole state and say, well, in, like, if something went wrong with the, the download, this is the view you, you need to show as an error. Um, when a view first loads, you can now run async tasks, which is, um, makes a lot of things easy. And the old libraries that we used for downloading data from the internet, which had a horrendous callback system, which was just a nightmare to use, now becomes exactly what you would expect from JavaScript. Like you place the call, await, and manage the data afterwards. And this is why I downloaded the beta yesterday and really I shouldn't have done until after the demo. Um, when it, this was first announced, all this new functionality could only be used in iOS 15, which for developers who've been using SwiftUI for a while was a, a nightmare because it meant they couldn't really use them in their existing products uh, because they needed to support iOS 13 or 14 maybe. Um, but they've just announced a way in which you can actually um, make those features available on older versions of iOS, which is for existing app developers is a big boon and means that take up of all these asynchronous features is going to be a lot quicker. So I can actually, for my last demo, just give uh, an example of a uh, front-end client that actually uses all those features. We go to... Okay. So I'm going to take a JSON feed from the movie database, which is like an open source version of IMDB, and the quality of the data reflects that. Uh, and I really should not have used this resolution. Oops. This. So the state model here, so we've got a list of movies, the current page that we're on, and the total number of movies. This is a paginated list. We'll return 20 movies at a time. Um, and I've got three functions as part of this object as well. Um, doing a, a load of a page, and you can see here, it's just like, I'm not gonna show you the actual API call, but it's like, 
this is the call. Uh, and there's a bit of error handling. And the error handling is basically just going to print the error. Um, and when you refresh it, it's just going to reset everything and then load the first page again. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> 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 right. Four, right? Two. Two. Right. So if I go, I can't. No, that's not. Ah, yeah. Okay. Let's see if this runs. So yeah, so we've got. Um, I've put in the top left the number of items that it's currently loaded and the total number that they currently are. Um, in the result row, I've actually got a task with, uh, where's my cursor gone again? Um, so, every time a new row is loaded, it's just gonna check, so am I the last one in the list? If I am, can you load the next page, please? And that means that as we scroll down, so you can see when the scroll bar on the right, it seems to be coming to the end. And please do this. Yeah, yeah, so, and then suddenly we're up to 40. Well, no, all it does is basically looks and says like, oh, it's like you, you, we're just about to load the, the movie with this ID. Is that the last one in the list? If it is, let's go off and get some more. And because the, that view kicks off actually just before the, the view is due to come on screen, um, it actually feels like the whole list is already there. Uh, and in terms of searching, you you can all, you can set um, auto completes. So it's like when you enter the search box, you can give it a list of either things that you've previously searched for, or just like trending topics or anything like that. Clicking on one of these will um, just populate up to the top. I haven't quite worked out how they're supposed to disappear straight away yet. Um, but otherwise, if you search for, let's search for. And the code for that is, again, it's just like what, when that is submitted, it just does a, um, an API call really quickly. Um, and then I'm trying to build a really fancy page and got nowhere. One thing that is actually quite nice on iOS, which I don't uh, do, 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 is you see both that background was actually a blurred photo. And the way that is achieved in iOS is using a thing called material. <laughs> so here we have code that is given a particular URL, it's loading an async image. Once it's found it, it makes it resizable and changes it um, aspect, uh, yeah, changes the content mode so it's gonna fill what the space that it has available. Um, and then on top of that, you, in the overlay, we have a rectangle using what's called a material, which basically gives opacity and blur. And then when we run it, looks like that, and if we were to Comment out those bits, you can actually see the, the photo that's underneath. Then applying the, the material is really easy. So it's like that sort of effect is like a one liner. You see that all over iOS as well. I think this quote came into Twitter the other day and with the announcement that Google are actually um, suspending the use of their material design library on iOS 
uh, in favor of customizing um, the existing Apple components and using Swift UI. Um, obviously, there's like a long way to go before Gmail on the iPhone looks like an iPhone app instead of an Android app. But, um, but yes, yeah, like the fact that that someone at his level is actually talking about being able to use this as for native development is a big, big shot in the arm. We've got a little bit of time. For any questions? Is there a testing framework? There is. Uh, Apple has uh, unit testing and uh, uh, UI testing. Uh, two framework systems. Um, the difficulty is when you actually have that state built into the view, um, isolating unit testing in that um, in that scenario is really tricky. Um, so what we were intending to do is actually move stuff out into state objects, which are standalone and can be tested much more reliably. Um, there is also uh, a website and podcast series uh, called Point Free, who have built their own system, which they call the composable architecture, which takes everything that SwiftUI does and reconfigures it into something that is 100% testable. Unfortunately, it also is 100% exactly like Redux, which is not nice. And it's really hard to actually work out how to actually use, because you have to actually first work out how to do something in SwiftUI and then work out how to redo it in their architecture. Um, but moving, keeping as much state as possible in state objects really does help. It's better design anyway. Sorry. The state objects is that that's a better design anyway. I, I would say so. I think it's like in the same way that for React components, state that uh, is about um, <clears throat> transient change in a particular object to still state state. Um, it, it just makes it a little bit harder to test. So if you've got something where sort of like the only changeable state in a component is a Boolean, it uh, becomes a, a lot easier to deal with if you've extracted all the, the stuff that is really complex. Is there a sort of de facto equivalent to this over in Android land at the moment, or is that still a bit more or less? Um, I don't know completely. I've heard a lot of stuff about Jetpack Compose, which is something that people have been talking about on comparative terms. Also Flutter, which is a which is a cross-platform tool. Um, I spent a weekend trying to install Flutter and gave up on Sunday evening um, and it still wasn't working. Yeah. Um, Flutter uses Dart, which is like Google's own language, which isn't used for anything else. Um, but but yeah, so like the, the installation apparently is the, the really, really hard part. And once you actually get um, a fully working development environment mm -hmm. then um, basically you've invested so much time then you carry on using it. Have you made much in anger? In anger? As in for real? Uh, I've got a couple of projects which are 50-60% there. Unfortunately I get, so I'm using them to learn as I go mm -hmm. as well so it's sort of like um, every so often I break them all down and restart just to see if I can apply what I've learned and then never actually get any further towards completion. But we will get there one day. Do you think the time then, obviously this is pretty simple to actually get something up and running which really nice online, it's still there. Do outside of, if you want to release cross platform, you have to pick another way to build it through Android. Do you think mm -hmm. that makes this a bit good viable solution so that people to produce an app on both, or is it better if you're only interested in targeting iOS? I, yeah, I'm slightly biased because I don't never never have any Android phones, yeah. so it's like no, no ten. But um, I would say, it's like, definitely from a from my point of view as an iOS user, the end result mm -hmm. for me is massive a massive improvement from anything that uh, using React Native could do. Um, partly because React Native because it uses the JavaScript core within um, the iPhone apps. Like you don't get as much usage of all the processing power um, that a native app can get. Um, I can't speak for what it's like on the, the Android side. I suspect it might be slightly easier if you don't have to worry about supporting iOS in the same code base. 
yeah. um, because you like you can then like really lean into all the stuff that Android phones can do, um, and not have to worry about um, like cross compatibility with um, Apple hardware. Yeah. So if you were creating a new Android phone, what would you Scratch was just going to iOS and just switch over. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I hope so. How many times quickly do you think that could be? It's like, how long is your piece of string? <laughs> <laughs> is it a relatively simple to operate class for the next version comes out? Like, is that super happy? So, Pre Pretty much the um, every method and object within the Swift framework is marked by Apple as which versions it uses, and like if the, if a particular method gets deprecated, um, you get warnings quite straight away. Um, the big changes happen once a year at WWDC every June, uh, and um, and then they release a new version of Xcode, and you have to work out whether the, your app that was working is crashing because. The Swift UI has changed, or just Xcode is shit. Um, but uh, yeah, you will get deprecations. You can also mark your own code as um, you can ask. You can put in conditions saying, so like, if you if this is running on iOS 14, use this code. If it's running on iOS 15 or above, use this code. So you can you can choose to opt out of any particular changes until you've got the code that will actually take advantage of the, the next operating system. I really like the constraints of the design. Like if someone's designing for it, would you want them to know that you're going to be building it in Swift UI first, and then these are some things that you should be sticking to? Or is it kind of no design you want to build? Um, I think there are some really good like template kits out there for things like Sketch and Figma that have like all the standard controls. So like, the closer you are to using so, like Apple standard controls, um, the easier life is going to be. Um, but there is no reason why you couldn't go the whole hog and like instead of using a standard button, create a, a view and handle all the gestures yourself and the like what it looks like when you're, you're when you're holding down on it, and you could build new items really quickly but it might be that i think the way that the the styling system works where you can create a, a button style so you you have a component called button which manages all the changes in state for you and then you have con pure control over the visuals i think that goes a long way to um, giving you as much freedom as you possibly can what those styles within it's similar to like experts like yeah so in your view effectively so like your view has the like everything in one place so you, it's not like you have a style sheet in css that might be in that same file or might be referencing something else or you might be using a css module it's like it should all be there which ends up can if you're doing some really complicated views can look a bit weird sometimes, but if you break it down and keep it into simple components, it actually works a lot better, I think. That's it. Awesome. Anybody's interested, there are some links up here. So I will share this around if you want. <laughs>